see if people hear me. I've been advised that you should wear the headphones if you want to really hear. There's a lot of background noise, interrupts, and uh, I think it's better if you if you have the headphones. I'm all right. We've had a, a little bit of a, a hitch, but I think that's inevitable in in, in these things. And uh, my computer's gone blank again. So I want to welcome you to this session here in uh, the Peatlands Pavilion. This, this session is hosted by the International Peatland Society, no, known as the IPS. Uh, my name is Jack Riley. I hope you can tell from my accent that I'm Scottish. In fact, I'm a Washingtonian after the town in which I was born and, and lived for the first part of my life. It's about 16 miles southeast of where we are at the moment. I also claim to be a Glaswegian because I lived in this wonderful city for several years when I was an undergraduate at uh, the University of Glasgow, one of the most prestigious universities in the world. Not just because I went there, but because of others. I also have to apologize because this session should be chaired by the IPS uh, president, Marco Pomerantz, from Estonia, but unfortunately, he contracted COVID a few days ago, and that stopped his, uh, his travel plans. I was responsible for arranging this session, inviting the participants, putting it together, engaging people who have to speak very briefly and to squeeze in the 11 presentations within 60 minutes or so. And that is, that is my, I suppose, second challenge of this morning. The first challenge was getting here um, by Scott Rail from the seaside town of Guruk, and then the maze of uh, the uh, low-level rail service in, uh, in, in, uh, in Glasgow. But uh, here I am. I am uh, one of the two vice presidents of the International Peatland Society, and uh, the other vice president, uh, Gus van Berkel, is here on the, the platform, and he will be one of, one of the, the, the presenters. My academic credentials are as, as a botanist, that is my degree from the University of Glasgow, and then an ecologist, conservationist, and peatland management advisor. The International Peatland Society, and we have some slides to go along with me here, um, was established in 1968 as an international non-governmental not-for-profit organization registered in Finland. It has a membership of around 1,700, and these are located in 33 countries, of which some 1,500 are individual peatland experts, and about 200 are peat industry companies and associations. The IPS is a unique organization with this mix of peatland and peat experts and businesses involved in peat extraction and downstream uses of peat. Membership is open to every individual and organization with interest and or involvement in any aspect of peatland and peat, including biodiversity, ecology, hydrology, extraction, restoration, culture, anything you care to mention. IPS is funded by its members and governed by a federation of 17 national committees. I have to stress that uh, with this membership, uh, we do have uh, some lively debates, but we have quite a strict policy that although we have peat industry members, we do not lobby on their behalf. We try to have fair and open discussion across the entire spectrum. 
I'm going to jump a little bit. I just want to say that the International Peatland Society was actually formed by the peat industry in 1968 because it, uh, it was, uh, let's say, on the up at that time, heavily involved in peat extraction for energy. That has since declined and will soon disappear and also increasing in uh, the area of, of horticulture. But very little scientific knowledge was available and uh, there were no organizations and uh, um, so societies that, uh, that could deal with that. And the IPS was formed to fill that, uh, fill, fill that gap. But now 53 years on, on, because that's how old IPS is, we are now in the world of climate change, awareness and emergency, in which peatlands and peat are implicated strongly. IPS recognises this fact and highlights it in its strategy, congresses, publications, and by collaborating with partners with similar aims. The title of this session is about partnerships, and the objective of the presentations is to highlight and show and uh, inform you of some of the important partnerships that uh, exist uh, between members of the IPS, but also between them and other scientists in the, in the general. And, uh, and this is many. A partnership can be from two individuals or, uh, or, or associations or universities up to an indeterminate number, something I'll, I'll just mention. One of our original partnerships was with the International Mire Conservation Group, IMCG, whose Secretary General Hans Houston is uh, in the audience today. And we have had a long uh, uh, period of uh, interaction between us, which we have had some very good discussions and arguments and, and, and so on. But we, we started with the publication of the benchmark book, Wise Use of Myers and Peatlands, published in 2002 and presented at the Ramsar Corp in that year in, uh, in the city of Valencia uh, in, in Spain. We have had other partnerships uh, since then, and we have published uh, that book. We then published a, a book called Peatlands and Climate Change in 2008, and that had around 30 authors in that book, and it is currently in the process of being updated and extensively revised. It is uh, edited by Maria Strack of the University of Waterloo in Canada, and uh, she is one of the presenters and will inform you about this book. We had hoped it would be ready for this COP, but it's uh, no easy task coordinating such a large number of, of people. But I've seen the draft, some of the draft chapters and they're absolutely excellent. So we'll look uh, forward, uh, forward to that. Right, I, th I think that's, uh, I th I'll just show a, get to the, the end of this IPS. We focus on really uh, the uh, sustainable development goals. We have three main commissions, economy, environment, and society. Underneath those, we have 12 expert groups and a whole range of peatland matters. The things we do, I've roughly mentioned, and uh, everything apart from one secretary general, everything is done by volunteer input and uh, that means we are dependent on people giving their giving their time and uh, I think that's uh, there I've already said too much and being being me I've overrun my time but I did want to say just one thing about partnerships IPS has just joined a new partnership under a pro project of the Green Deal from the European Union. And uh, this is under the Horizon Programme. Uh, this uh, is a partnership of 45 different uh, peatland experts and institutes and associations. And uh, the title of this, just to let you know, is called 
mainstreaming ecological restoration of freshwater related ecosystems in the landscape context, dash innovation, upscaling and transformation. The acronym is MERLIN and you watch out for MERLIN, it uh, commenced on the 1st of October. IPS has only a tiny budget. If I told you that the total budget of this project is in excess of 21 million euros, it's not, it's not a small project. Uh, we, get, uh, we get a very little, but important part, because it's important for this project to know what is the peat industry through IPS doing for peatland restoration in the past, now, and where will it fit in in the future? So we look forward um, to that. Now, as I said, I've said too much and I've overrun, which is, uh, is my right. And I now want to welcome the, the person who will welcome you. And it's my very good friend, former master student at the University of Nottingham, Dr. Alu Dohong, who by dint of his hard work, dedication and perseverance is currently Vice Minister in the Indonesia Ministry of Environment and Forestry. One of the most important and powerful ministries in that country. To say a few words, I am proud to know him and his achievements. Alu is a Dayak and like Scots, their, their word is their bond. It is through the support of his extended family colleague, Suido Limin, who sadly passed away at too young an age, that I was able to achieve what I did in the peat swamp forests of Kalimantan Tenga in over a period of 25 years. Allah will welcome you to the session on peatland partnerships in climate change mitigation and nature recovery. Over to you, Allah. Say, I stand here? Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. You're, you're wired, so we just... Can I bit close this one, Jack? This is you, right? Yeah, it's a new... <laughs> oh, silver. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Prop uh, Jack Riley, my teacher, my guru, and my professor. So it's my uh, honor to standing here before all of you. Uh, I know uh, IPS is like a center of excellence for uh, peatland and peat uh, scientific communities. So I'm very uh, proud and very uh, pleased to, to standing here just to say a few words as uh, Jack mentioned earlier maybe just one or two minutes. So first of all, uh, I think uh, scientific uh, base is very crucial and very important to develop regulation, policy, action, and implementation of peat, land, peat and peatland management on the ground. So we can, you know, to do uh, or to implement peatland management, restoration, rehabilitation, and, and so on, just by doing trial and error. So therefore, scientific basis, scientific uh, knowledge is are crucially important to do it in the better and proper ways. So I know IPS is uh, the, the, the huge organization that comprises so many scientific uh, uh, communities, also businesses, practices, and so on. So I think it's very, very important organization in, in, in the world that can guide not only government, but also uh, private sector, NGOs, and other communities in order to implement peatland sustainable and wise use peatland management, restoration, rehabilitation, and so on. I know a peatland, um, you know, we have a very huge peatland uh, globally, right? But actually we don't have a unifying 
definition about pit itself because they are very different in certain aspect. You can apply, you know, approaches or technical approaches in boreal and temperate peatland, for example, to the tropical peatlands because they are different in terms of uh, geographic condition, in terms of climatic regime, in terms in, in term of social economic aspect, including in terms of policy dimension. So therefore, very important to see that, to adjust that, and so on. And I just to let you know that Indonesia has a very long history, you know, about neglected uh, scientific base in uh, doing uh, peatland management and and utilization. Uh, case, uh, for example, is, uh, if you know, like 25 years ago, we have uh, one million uh, project, uh, agriculture project, or we, we, we call it a one million hectare uh, project, peatland in central Kalimantan, exactly in my hometown. Yeah? So at the time, uh, the previous government just opened up about one million hectares of pristine and secondary uh, peatland forest and peat to become agriculture. And the project eventually failed because lack of scientific advice, lack of scientific guidance, and lack of scientific uh, practices. So that's why, again, I stress here, the, the research, the scientific is very important, very crucial, but I also need to learn, as all of, all of us, of course, that doing research is better, but doing research for research is probably we need to consider that. We have to doing research in order to implement that research on the ground. I know researchers sometimes need a long-term uh, uh, long time to do it, right? Not a very specific, but I think for the last 50 years, we already have quite enough or necessary knowledge about that. So we, we don't need to start from zero anymore. We, we already have the scientific uh, knowledge uh, adequately, uh, so that just can adjust that on, on the ground. I think that's very important to, to all of us. So our failures in the ex mega project, for example, um, we learn a lot that capacity building, expertise is very are important. So that's why Jack Riley, like 25 years ago, and Professor Hosaki from uh, Hokkaido University tried to teach so many Indonesian students. Yeah, including myself. I've been trained in in UK, in Nottingham University, about how to do. A, I mean, to learn, you know, deeply about pit and peatland itself, in order to build our knowledge, our expertise. So when we, uh, you know, go to the ground to do a research, to do a development, and we already have, you know, a specific knowledge. So I think uh, one important aspect is capacity building. And I know this uh, are a big challenge. So, so I think IPS also can facilitate, you know, how to train people, train communities, how to provide guidelines, technical guidelines, how to, to implement sustainable peatland management on the ground. So I think that my short speech. So I, 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 I hope this uh, session speakers can give all the participants both physically here and I, 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 I know that also online people are joining us, right? Uh, joining us and give more perspective, give more uh, knowledge and experience, uh, share knowledge and experience between the speaker and participants. And I think that's all from me and thank you very much for your all kind attention. Good morning. Thanks very much. I have to go. I, I know, it's okay. I'm pleased you came. Very good for us. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks to the Vice Minister for spending his valuable time to come and uh, introduce this session. I think it uh, 
adds to the prestige of the proceedings. And I did ask him to stress the value of uh, basic and fundamental research into peatlands and peat, which is absolutely essential before people can um, make cases of what they should or should, shouldn't do with it. And uh, as I say, this is scientist. We must try to move on a little bit quicker. The next, uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Maria Strike of the University of, uh, of Waterloo. Maria is a Canada Research Chair in Ecosystems and Climate, leads an internationally recognised research programme investigating greenhouse gas exchange in, in peatlands. This includes participation in some of the first peatland reclamation projects in Alberta's oil sands. She works closely with industry, government and non-government organisations to translate her findings into improved land management in the face of climate change. Um, we'll ask uh, uh, Maria to tell us something about the revised Peatlands and Climate Change book, which she is editing. Thanks a lot. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, I will try to be brief and just introduce quickly uh, the new edition of the Peatlands and Climate Change book. Uh, pictured here is the original version from 2008. And we've been working very hard with a large team of authors over the last year to update it with the over a decade of excellent peatland research that's gone on since then. As most of us know who are here today, uh, peatlands play an important role in the climate system by storing carbon in peat, as well as exchanging other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide. And the rates of these exchanges is driven by the climate, but in turn uh, affects the climate through the release of these greenhouse gases. And we know that over the past several thousand years, this has led to a small amount of net cooling. But we also know that uh, direct disturbance of peatlands through uh, drainage, extraction, for example, other types of industries can convert these systems from carbon and greenhouse gas sinks into sources. And all of this will also be controlled by the ongoing climate change that we're facing. And so there's a lot of activity, and we've heard about that in the pavilion over the last few days, to restore and rewet these systems to protect those carbon stores and to return their greenhouse gas sink function. And that's driven by local to international policy. And so these are all of the topics that we cover uh, in the book and that we are updating in this new version. So I'll briefly go over the table of contents. The first section really provides an overview of what peat and uh, of peat and peatlands, some definitions, as well as looking at in a relatively undisturbed state, uh, how peat is accumulated, what has been the rate of that accumulation over time, and what are the contemporary rates of carbon and greenhouse gas exchange, and how do we expect that those will be altered by climate change. We then move on to a section that focuses on disturbance, and we have chapters on agriculture, forestry, and peat use for fuel, uh, and, and uh, growing media. But in this version, this edition of the book, we've also added another chapter, which focuses on some of the uh, more understudied anthropogenic disturbances. Uh, these may be things like roads, mines, hydroelectric reservoirs that also cover an important area of peatland, but maybe we know a little bit less about and set the stage for these other disturbances that are much uh, better studied. And so we'll, we'll do that in chapter four. The last section of the book then looks at the climate impacts of restoration and rewetting, uh, as well as uh, compiling information about how we report these greenhouse gas emissions uh, in our national inventory reports and under climate conventions, and also uh, updated in this edition to think about the other international conventions and organizations that play an important role in peatland management. And then finally, we'll combine that information from the earlier chapters to look at some scenarios in peatland management, particularly thinking about how these may be affected on, uh, by a changing climate. 
So as Jack said, we're working on the text now. We're finalizing chapters. Just to give you a teaser of what you'll find in the book, we will have full color photos and figures. And so on the left here are examples of photos of some of those understudied anthropogenic disturbances. And on the right, you see the stages of peat extraction. We've also worked really hard to provide an up-to-date compilation of the data and the science. And so here's an example of a compilation of greenhouse gas and carbon balances in relatively undisturbed peatlands around the world. And we're compiling data also on the effects of anthropogenic disturbance and restoration. And so you see an example here on the left of methane and nitrous oxide emissions from forestry drained peatlands. And on the right, the radiative forcing uh, that is associated with the use of peat as fuel in comparison to coal and other land use uh, scenarios. So we anticipate that the book will be available in early 2022, but you can already place your pre-order. Uh, the link for that is here, and we anticipate the price to be around 30 euros. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Maria, for that excellent uh, introduction to this, uh, this fantastic uh, new book. Your last statement leads me to just say, it's a bargain, you know, you know what books cost. And this is being published by the International Peatland Society um, at, um, at, at minimal cost and, uh, and no profit. So please uh, watch that, that space. I'm not going to take any questions on people's presenters as they give, I'm just going to rattle through each one and please save everything up for the the panel discussion, which will be Q and A and, and, and things that you want to get off your, off your chest. But um, those in the audience can raise their hands and I'll uh, recognize them. But we're also inviting <laughs> online questions from anyone anywhere in the world. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I'll move on to the next presentation, which is a, is a duo um, from or a, a duet uh, given by uh, Professor Peter Whittington of Brandon University of Canada and Professor Lynn Rochford of the University of Laval in Quebec, uh, <laughs> Canada. And they're going to present uh, um, on the uh, peatland restoration, the case of Canada. I'll just mention briefly, Pete is Associate Professor in Geography and Environment at Brandon University in Manitoba. His graduate degree is focused on understanding the hydrology of anthropogenically disturbed peatlands, and he has continued his theme with fen restoration of extracted peatlands in southeastern Manitoba. Lynn is well no known in the International Peatland Fraternity as uh, an expert on peatland uh, restorations, and she is leader in peatland ecological restoration in North America and a pioneer in this field. She's been director of Peatland Ecology Research Group, PERG, for the past 30 years, authored 155 peer-reviewed papers, and her professional and academic career led her to visit and evaluate a wide range of wetland restoration projects in more than 40 countries. She is a true e expert, and I believe she will be giving this presentation. Good morning, everybody. So um, first, I'm, um, I want to thank IPS for inviting me and giving me the chance to present our result of the past 30 years of research. And uh, my colleague, Pete Winnington, sent his best wishes, is right now transiting on a plane, so that's why he could not be joining us. And also from start, I'd like to thank you know, all the um, hardworking students that make uh, this uh, achievement of, achievement of uh, successfully uh, restoring peatlands in Canada um, uh, to uh, all the hard work through the years and all the collaborative work that's been done in partnership. And this would not have been possible without the long-term support from the Canadian peat industry, the CSPMA. So, if I move to this uh, first, what I'd like to first start is that really everybody um, has to understand that peatland restoration is really country context dependent. As um, our colleague Alou just said in his, uh, in, in, in his introduction. 
So what we have to understand is where we come from and it helps understand what action we have been doing. So in Central Europe, they started to do uh, uh, um, the restoration of peat extracted field maybe 10, 20 years before we started in North America. And choices on actions or the restoration action were driven by you know, their historical land uses, uh, it's post-agriculture usually, um, and a legacy pathway of uh, often rewetting uh, their landscape. Um, in, in, and then if you look here on the right, in North America from start, like we started later in 1990s, and um, we focus more on uh, plant reintroduction, mostly the peat mosses. And um, this has been uh, leading us uh, to um, uh, some good results. Here I'm presenting only one graph, but I don't, I will not go interpret, I mean, I will not go in detail, but just look at this pale blue line that says immediate active restoration. That uh, we have measured, my colleagues, you know, of the peat and ecology research group, uh, uh, um, including Maya Strike that just spoken, and Nigel Roulet and Ian Strachan from McGill, they have shown through different means of looking at the carbon fluxes that if we go and, and we restore right away post extraction with plant reintroduction, then you end up within a relatively short time uh, uh, on the positive result to mitigate, to be able to mitigate climate change where um, it will take a, a longer time if you just do some um, um, uh, active restoration, but not including the plant restoration. So just to say that in North America, we started small, really. We focused a lot in the beginning of the 90s on understanding the biology of sphagnum. There was all a new field. Now you have to, nobody had manipulated mosses uh, prior to the uh, uh, 1990s. Uh, so understanding their survival uh, in their, uh, these harsh environment that uh, help us to go up to um, uh, scaling up, you know, restoration. That led to uh, develop uh, the moss layer transfer technique as a peatland restoration method, which uh, involves uh, surface preparation, plant harvesting, plant spreading, uh, straw mulch application. We're using a bit of fertilizer to, to help a nursery plant for the sphagnum mosses. And then that lastly, we do the rewetting and the ditch blocking. And as you see here, 15 year post restoration, the type of landscape that um, uh, we can get. And then on the, on, on the right, if you don't restore exactly the same site, then there's just continued peat oxidation and we still go on to lose a lot of peat where within 15 years, you can, you can have a nice 25 centimeter of uh, sinum carpet accumulation. Um, now, what are we doing in Western Canada? And that's led by Pete Winnington projects. Um, uh, we are now focusing more on uh, fan restoration because we have larger fans in Western Canada, uh, uh, upon which, you know, um, a Boy Island are developed and where we can extract peat. And uh, we see that it's really important to, to develop ecotone linkages uh, between the former fans or the forested uh, lowland and uh, the former peat extraction. So this is now the, the, some of the um, next frontiers in our research. Um, we have guidelines that are free to download. So I'm just giving you here the, uh, the um, website where you can get them. And uh, this is a third edition. And uh, we've been implementing this in North America over uh, 3,500 hectares so far. Uh, we have a whole array of publication that tells you about the um, different um, um, recovery success uh, of uh, biodiversity structure plant composition. Um, also, um, through the year, we have been monitoring the recovery of several ecological attributes of the restored peatlands, and here to name a few that we know we can uh, restore the uh, uh, carbon accumulation function in, within the um, uh, windows of 20 to 15 years. Uh, we can, uh, with this method, 82% of the vascular plants spontaneously will um, uh, be restored. Um, then uh, by accidentally, we, um, the fire went through a 10 years 
um, old uh, restore peatland. And uh, we were pleased to see that um, uh, within two years, it bounced back. So we can be a uh, restore peatland can be fire resistance and show short term resilience. And also we work on uh, the nursery where we get the, the, the mosses and then within five to 10 years, you are able to just go back to the same site over and over for uh, doing to restoring other sites. So um, the moss layer transfer technique, you know, it's, it's, it's um, uh, an approach where the sphagnum moss reintroduction helps you to really jumpstart the peat accumulation process. Uh, it is being trialed and, and, and applied in different countries in the world. I've seen trials also in Australia and, and really different parts. And I'd say that really for sphagnum peatland, I'm not talking other types of peatland, I'm not thinking here of Indonesia, of forest farm, but um, we do know, we have the knowledge, the ecological knowledge ought to restore it. There might be other economics and pin, um, you know, um, um, barrier, but uh, we know how to do it. And so it is possible to restore uh, these peatlands. So um, lastly, I just want to tell you that in the next two years, there's gonna be uh, two major conference, one in 2023, uh, which will be held in Quebec City in collaboration with the International Peatland Society. And then we welcome you in China to the uh, 17 International Peat Congress to see the latest world effort in peatland restoration. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. That was an excellent uh, um, presentation to us with so many uh, interesting and uh, important facts. And uh, we know that uh, you and your teams are experts in restoration and can be very helpful in passing on knowledge. I want to move on to the next uh, speaker who is uh, Dr. Uh, Lydia Cole of uh, the University of St Andrews in, in Scotland. We're going to move from, from Canada to Peru and uh, Lydia will talk us something or tell us about Peru's lowland peatlands. Lydia is a conservation ecologist with a keen interest in how tropical ecosystems can be managed sustainably in the face of agricultural expansion and other pervasive impacts of population growth. She's particularly interested in peat scapes and how they can be responsibly managed through an understanding of their unique hydrological requirements and vegetation communities and as I said at the beginning she's a, an associate lecturer and research fellow in the School of Geography at Sustainable Development at the University of St Andrews. Over to Lydia. Thank you Jack um, and I'd briefly like to thank the International Peatland Society for giving me an opportunity to give you a brief tour today of the tropical peatlands of the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, so I'm based on the other side of Scotland as Jack just mentioned at the University of St Andrews. And the goal of my talk today is to convey the importance of Peru's Amazonian peatlands for nature conservation, sustainable livelihood provision and climate change mitigation. Drawing on the research being done by members of the Tropical Wetlands Consortium. So this is an international group comprising the institutions shown here, which are principally YAP, for the Research Institute of the Peruvian Amazon, and a variety of universities in the UK. So what do the peatlands of the lowland Peruvian Amazon look like? Uh, this is a typical peat swamp forest from above and just trying to, oh, sorry, there we go. Um, and from under the canopy, uh, this is a peat forming palm swamp, the most extensive type of peatland ecosystem in this region. These swamps are dominated by the Mauritia flexuosa palm shown here which produces the aguaje fruit. These peat forming ecosystems are distributed across the lowland Peruvian Amazon, uh, which is the area shown in gray on this map. Adam Hasty and colleagues have been developing a model of the predicted distribution of peatlands across the whole of this region, building on past work by Uti Latinoya and Freddie Draper through the addition of extensive new ground data. The majority of peat forming ecosystems are found in the Pastaza Marignon Foreland Basin, which is a subsiding geological basin to the east of the Andes, 
that experiences flooding every year, uh, creating waterlogged conditions that are perfect for the formation of peat. Adam's model predicts that the below ground carbon stock of these peat soils is nearly six petagrams, which to put that into perspective is comparable to the carbon stored above ground across all of Peru's ecosystems, despite these peatlands covering just 5% of Peru's land surface. So these peatlands are key to climate change mitigation and protecting them could play a really central role in Peru's nationally determined contributions to the UN Paris Agreement. trying to change slides. But, um, oh, apologies. Giant. Oh. Um, sorry about this. There we go. There are a variety of ecosystems that accumulate peat in this region. Um, in addition to the palm swamps, Peatland pole forests and open peatlands are the other two major peat forming ecosystem types, with some pole forests that we've been to containing up to eight metres thick of peat. Eurydice Honorio and colleagues um, did extensive field work to further explore the ecological diversity of these wetland ecosystems and to more accurately model their distribution within the Pastaza Marignon basin. Our research to date demonstrates that these ecosystems are largely hydrologically intact and so accumulating peat. They also contribute to high levels of regional diversity um, containing a variety of unique trees and palms and some animal species adapted to the acidic and waterlogged conditions of these peatlands. As well as being the most abundant peat farming ecosystems, the palm swamps are also really important um, to people living in and around them. So Manuel Man um, Martin Branias and colleagues have worked for some time now with the indigenous Ururina communities to learn about the customs and cultures associated with um, these palm swamps. The Ururina use the Mauritia flexuosa palm to make fibers, which are then woven into mats that you can see in this photo. The guaje fruit um, are also nutritionally and economically important in many communities. A project led by Katie Ruku and Christopher Schulz demonstrated the variety of other values these ecosystems hold for local communities, from sources of timber to a range of wild meat. They also found that these peatlands are seen as places of danger to some communities due to the ease of getting lost in them. But these peatlands and their carbon stocks are not free from threats. Um, Katie Ruku and Eurydice Honorio recently mapped the location of proposed roads relative to these ecosystems. And even more recently, Ian Lawson and colleagues um, have been exploring the vulnerabilities of these peatlands to some of those threats. For example, the ongoing use of aging pipelines. Our work has highlighted to us that to effectively support the role these peatlands play in climate change mitigation and nature conservation, Partnerships are key at all levels. Tim Baker and colleagues emphasize the importance of collaborative international networks of scientists for data collection and of building long-term relationships with policymakers. All of the research presented today has involved international partnerships and local partnerships with indigenous and mestizo or mixed ethnicity communities within Amazonia. Finally, um, these partnerships have highlighted the importance of these peatlands and the resources and spaces they contain for local communities. And a key way to promote their conservation is to promote the people and cultures currently living in and around them, through, for example, providing equipment and training to help local communities harvest aguaje in non-destructive ways. So I'd just like to thank you all for listening. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about the research and outreach of the Tropical Wetlands Consortium, then you can click on the link in this slide. Um, and I've also included the link to an exhibition that we have online of photographs of many ecological and social dimensions of Peru's lowland peatlands. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Lydia. Another tremendously, I think, uh, appealing and informative presentation and again stressing the importance of partnerships
but not just partnerships from the outside, partnerships with the countries in which the research is being done, and especially capacity capacity building, so that uh, people in their native to their own country can take over, learn, and then carry on, and make sure that uh, if the success of of, of research is uh, is guaranteed. Next, there is uh, another. Uh, double act presentation we're going to move uh, around the, the world again and this time we're, we'll be in indonesia uh, in uh, central kalimantan and, uh, or as we say kalimantan denga and uh, and there we will be informed by two people one is uh, dr dharma nazir who is director of the center for international cooperation in sustainable management of tropical peatland known as Sim Simtrop and it is a, a center in the University of Palankaraya in um, in central Kalimantan and uh, oh, the other uh, presenter co-op presenter is Dr. Mark uh, Harrison. Dharma I mentioned uh, what he is where he is um, he is another of my uh, Proteges. He has a master's degree from the University of Nottingham. He also has a, a PhD, but in uh, in social attributes of, of tropical peatland, something that are grossly understudied. Mark, on the other hand, uh, is uh, if I find his uh, crib, um, he is a postdoctorate research fellow at the University of Exeter, an honorary visiting fellow at the University of Leicester and research director of the Borneo Nature Foundation International and that is based in uh, what is called the Natural Laboratory for peat, Tropical Peatland uh, allied to Simtrop and that is one of the facilities that I established almost 30 years ago with my colleague Suido Limin whom I mentioned at the beginning in my talk sadly passed away so things i did a long time ago fortunately um are still there there is a very nice video that mark is going to show and, and present so we'll uh, pass over to him to, um, to um, tell us about this fascinating ecosystem
jarak tujuh meter dua puluh. Oke, ya. Seratus dua puluh empat. Is he finished? I didn't know if he was going to speak, you see. Isn't it fantastic what you can do with a drone? This is a, an area that I first entered 30 years ago. And when I got there, I decided this is where I had to be. But in those days, you had to have a harangue and chop your way in. And, uh, and, and every day was uh, very hard work and stressful. I'm so pleased that some others have taken over both the University of Palankaraya and people like Mark. The main objective when he went there was to save Orang Utan. In the Sabanga catchment, which this is part of, there are estimated to be around 6,000 of them. The Sabanga catchment, I just want to mention, the peatland between major rivers is an area of almost 700,000 hectares. You know, you cannot imagine peat bogs of that size in this part of the world. Anyway, let's move on. The next uh, contribution, and I hope you're really impressed with that video, because I certainly um, am. Um, we move on to the next uh, speaker is, uh, is Rachel, uh, Rachel Tormenta, and I need to work through my crib notes, and uh, Rachel um, is a uh, Tyndall Centre re lecturer in climate change and international development, um, a position held jointly between the Tyndall Centre and the School of International Development um, in, uh, at the University of, uh, of East Anglia. Uh, she co-leads the Overcoming Poverty with Climate Actions research area within that centre and contributes to postgraduate and undergraduate teaching and she is going to tell us about uh, uh, from empirical research to policy opportunity peat fire management with social equity at the centre over to you rachel and i'll just and i think there's uh, something here for Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. And thanks to Jack and uh, the Peatland Society for this opportunity to share some work with you. So I'm at the University of East Anglia and the Tyndall Centre and uh, we'll share with you some research that we've been leading over the past years on uh, the governance of Indonesian peatland fires. So just to set the scene, Indonesian peatland fires are a persistent governance challenge and have become near annual events. They have different characteristics shared with other wicked problems or um, sort of insurmountable, at least very challenging environmental issues. And that's because, for instance, there is no clear problem definition. Different stakeholders think about the problem and solutions to it in different ways. So even just the general understanding that fire is bad isn't necessarily one shared by all. Also, solutions to peat fires have ramifications in other systems and other sectors. And so it's an interconnected issue. 
which again challenges our solutions. And of course, solutions are also hard to evaluate and take a long time to understand what works because of the network and the ricochet effects of uh, interfering or intervening in one area and how that ricochets into other sectors. So another key feature of Indonesian peatland fires is that really they require fire prevention. And that's because the substrate itself, I'm sure you all know, is the fuel for the fire. And so those fires can smolder over long times. They can go down into the peat and along coal seams and re-emerge in other places, meaning that really to control them, prevention is best because uh, stopping them once they start is incredibly difficult and requires a massive amount of resources. So what I wanted to do in these few minutes is just to give you some sound bites, if you like, some key findings from a set of empirical work that we've been leading over the last couple of years. And a caveat of that then is this isn't an exhaustive set of policy recommendations. It's simply some of the key findings from work we've been doing, and it focuses in Riau, Sumatra. And it also assumes that peat fire mitigation should not extenuate vulnerabilities of already marginalized groups. And it recognizes that peat fire governance is a contested policy issue. So the first finding comes from some work that we did looking at stakeholder perceptions. And really the key thing, the message here is that understanding that diversity is absolutely crucial to informing sustainability over the long run. And Jack has talked about partnership, and I think that really is central because different stakeholders are thinking about the problem in such different ways. And so in some work we did, looking at the perceptions of 12 different stakeholder groups on how they consider the peat fire issue, we showed that experts, for instance, think very differently from the land user groups, and we found two distinct positions, if you like, one group that really preferred transformative um, options for sustainable peatland governance, such as large-scale rewetting, and others that preferred much more localised uh, fire mitigation measures that would therefore enable business as usual practices. And so negotiating between those positions is important for moving forward. We also looked at stakeholder perceptions on the burdens of peat fires. And what we found there was that stakeholders with very little in common, very different sets of interests uh, in the peat fire context, all came together in unison to agree that actually the health burden of peat fires is unacceptable. And so it suggests then that focusing on the health and the humanitarian dimension of peat fires is a powerful language for change and might be an entry point in those sorts of negotiations I mentioned before. We look too at the, at the diversity of peat, mitig peat fire mitigation uh, measures and we found an incredible diversity of those 60 different policy responses all relevant to peat fire in Riau, led by different stakeholders uh, using different types of strategies, so incentives or technical solutions. And a key finding here is that we really need to know what works out of this policy mix what can we say are effective strategies to mitigate peat fires? We need impact evaluation of those. And I think uh, Pat Allo talked about that in the beginning. He also talked about intervention targeting, and that's something we found in some work where we looked at different landscapes and we looked at what combinations of interventions work to reduce peat fire. And actually, context really matters. And so targeting uh, policy responses is essential. The different soil types, for example, uh, peat versus mineral soil, if we're talking about fire prevention, need very different types of approaches. Different farmer types, you know, different sets of capacities and access to technology to do things any differently all need to be taken into account. And so finally, it is uh, some findings we have on what were then the least controversial options, if we appreciate this is a very contested policy issue. And maybe these points of consensus, again, serve as entry points. And we found that together stakeholders thought uh, support for small-scale farmers to manage land without fire was essential, and yet preferred sanctions targeted towards large companies, uh, for example, cancelling licenses for using fire. So perhaps these least controversial 
of course, they are controversial to some stakeholders, but nevertheless, where the least controversial overall are starting points. And that's the papers which I've just drawn from, um, which we know they'll be available, of course, and happy to discuss methods with you all after. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Right, let's move on. I'm sorry as you and obviously see we're well behind time um it's not bothering me if it doesn't bother you but it's just eating into um panel discussion but i think these presentations are so interesting and so important that it's worth uh, going through them and we now swap to something quite different we're now going to um have a, a presentation from uh, someone who is uh, very active and working within the peat industry um, in Europe. Um, my friend and colleague uh, and uh, vice president uh, number one of the IPS, Gus van Berkel, and uh, he is going to talk ab about peat, a an important natural resource for food security and climate change mitigation. Gus obtained his master's degree on business administration from the University of Delft and Rotterdam, and also the title of Registered Financial Controller from the University of Maastricht. He has been the CEO of the company Greensveen AG in Germany, for, although he is a Dutchman, for more than 25 years. A company with production facilities in three other countries. Greensveen extracts peat and clay which are used to produce growing media and mushroom casing soil. And I'll pass over to, to Gus to give you his uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you, Jack. Um, my name is Guus van Berkel, as you told. I'm the vice president. And it is a, I'm the CEO of a mid-sized family-owned company, uh, which is active in the supply chain of the horticulture industry. And it is including growing media production and peat extraction. I'm very honored, honored to have this opportunity to give a presentation here in the Peatland Pavilion during COP27, 26. It's important that besides env environmental and social aspects of peatland and peat, also economic aspects are taken into account. That's the vision of the IPS towards responsible peatland management. I'm not re representing the industry. I speak here as vice president of the IPS, a multi-stakeholder NGO. In 2017, the RPS asked Chris Block of Wageningen University, a routing medium specialist, to give his projection for the worldwide demand for peat in the next 25 years. He consulted many sources and concluded the demand will double in by 2025. This was fully unexpected, perhaps, perhaps surprises you as well. The main driver behind Chris Block's prognosis is the growing world population, which will eat more vegetables and 80% of them will live in cities. So the use of peat is connected to other United Nations development goals like zero hunger. Another driver is the expectation that more and more edible and ornamental plants will be produced in closed systems in a protected environment, also mentioned as soilless growth. This way of growing has big advantages compared to traditional growing practices. It needs less water, 
less fertilizers, less pesticides, less land use for the same yield. This way of producing plants needs growing media, or maybe you, you, you say it here, potting compost. Nowadays, peat is the most important constituent of growing media. The current worldwide use of peat for this purpose is estimated to be 40 million cubic meters, which causes a yearly emission of 7 to 11 million tons of CO2 equivalent. These trends will boost the demand for growing media in the coming decades by 400%, as this forecast shows. It will grow from about, from about 59 million cubic meters now to 244 million cubic meters in 2050. And peat volume will grow from 40 to 80 million cubic meters. But the percentage of peat in growing media mixtures will decrease from 70% now to 30% in 2025. But as, it, as said, in volume will double. To replace peat by circular materials is a massive challenge for the horticulture industry and its suppliers, although research has been ongoing for 40 years. This is difficult while fit for purpose is key, and because of the simple fact that circular materials are not available in the right quantities and qualities. I would like to finish by showing the impact of the use of peat for horticulture. I do this to help governments, politicians and NGOs to focus and address their energy and money where the real problems are. As a percentage of land use, peat extraction accounts for 0.05% of worldwide peatlands. As a percentage of CO2 emissions from drained peatlands, peat extraction and its use accounts for 0.3%. My conclusion, we need smart solutions to meet multiple United Nations development goals. One of those smart solutions is certification of peat extraction based on the RPS wise use strategy and guidelines. This is the bridge to our next speaker, Maureen Kuhnen. She will re represent RPP certification. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Gus. This gives a, a, a completely different aspect of, of peat and peatlands, which uh, is something that uh, is always in the background and which is in the minds of uh, many people in this room and uh, and listening and i expect it will be subject to question and comment uh, later but uh, this industry exists it's very important and i'll move straight on to the next speaker that uh Chris, um mentioned uh maureen um Kaunen from uh, also from the it's from the the netherlands and she is uh, CEO of uh, a foundation called uh, Responsibly, Responsibly Produced Peak, or RPP, and it certifies uh, companies for peat extraction in terms of how they do it, if they can do it, and with a whole load of conditions and, uh, um, and, and, and uh, things to, to do and, and apply. But I'll let her tell you her part of the story. Maureen obtained a master's degree in biology from the University of Amsterdam. She specialised in tropical marine ecology, which is very nice. She spent 20 years working in the Caribbean on education awareness and research on coral reefs. And since 2017, she has been the executive officer of the Foundation Responsibly produce peak and she will tell us about the work of that foundation. Over to Maureen. Um, yes, Jack, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to you all. 
Uh, I want to thank the organizers of IPS for uh, inviting me here and having this opportunity. With this presentation, uh, I want to show you a bit more about responsibly produced peat so you can learn how its certification scheme is actually meaningful in the process to mitigate climate change. Um, yeah. So we experienced that the growing media industry is making the transition to use increasing amounts of renewable, oh, that was not the idea, uh, renewable and um, recyclable materials. However, currently peat is still essential for growing media. Now this peat shall be produced responsibly and RPP is a tool that can be used to do so. So RPP certification prevents negative impacts on natural peatland and creates opportunities for the future of degraded peatlands. Mm -hmm. Foundation responsibly produced peats or RPP, it's easier to, to say, <laughs> uh, is a multi-stakeholder organization and the stakeholders are coming from uh, the peat and grow media industry, from science and also environmental NGOs. This multi-stakeholder uh, involvement you can also see in the board and the committee of experts of RPP. And altogether, they created uh, a, a certification standard to develop the certification standard with criteria for production of peat in the European region. These criteria are on peatland selection and peatland management during and after peat extraction. Um, objective assessment is performed by independent inspectors and all these inspectors are actually uh, peatland experts and have good experience in the fields. Um, certification values of RPP, or no, the key values. <laughs> well, the whole certification scheme is extensive and can be found on our website, but there are three key values. And since the certif certification scheme was initially developed uh, to preserve biodiversity, uh, the first key value is there shall be no impact on high conservation values. So no degraded peatland can be selected for peat excavation and negative impacts on adjacent areas with high conservation values shall be mitigated. The second key value is the implementation of after use. This is the destination of the area after extraction has finished. And this shall be the best possible option with maximum environmental benefits, including climate mitigation. And this means that degraded areas are given a better and climate friendly future. The third key value of RPP, uh, which is also a very important one, is performing full stakeholder consultation that include also environmental NGOs and local communities. So this is not only required for the selection of peatland, but also for choosing the best after use uh, destination. So yeah, now RPP has reached a point for further development and sees opportunities here to turn peatlands from uh, to peatlands from a carbon source into a carbon sink. When drawing a roadmap to the future, in this roadmap, RPP can contribute to large uh, scale restoration. The industry has, uh, has good knowledge and also the machinery to do this. So with large scale restoration, it can help uh, uh, mitigation, mitigation of climate change. Also, RPP can facilitate polluted culture opportunities. So, um, uh, let me see. Yeah, so in, in, in this slide, you can see, for instance, the, the taipa farming or the sphagnum farming, and especially the sphagnum farming can serve as a constituent for growing media. So in the next year's possibilities and fundings will become available to invest in these opportunities and maybe also in other new opportunities. Now, let's sum up the role of RPP in environment uh, and climate change. So RPP contributes to sustainable peatland management by preserving impact on high conservation values. And in the middle column, you see RPP contributes to restoration by securing appropriate after use. 
In the, in the roadmap for climate change in the right column, OPP contributes to large scale restoration and opportunities for production of constituents for growing media coming from polluted culture. So there are some good partnering opportunities here. And in general, we all have to work together to reach the goals of climate change mitigation. So yeah, I hope this presentation has given you some good insights and especially how uh, RPP can be meaningful in, in during the transition time that is needed for the use of peat in, in growing media. So thank you all very much for your attention. Right, thank you very much, uh, Maureen. That's another excellent talk. And again, something different to give people something to, to think about. And again, a, a topic that we might get uh, questions if we have any time left for Q&A. Um, I think we're getting informed quite nicely though. I should mention that uh, I was uh, involved in the group of people that drew up the principles of the RPP project and uh, know a lot about it. And I was on its panel of experts for about 10 years. And uh, I think it's a very worthwhile thing in one, one way ahead to help uh, bridge some of the problems. Right, move on to the next speaker, who is Bert Hofer. And Hofer is uh, also, uh, he is a member uh, of the IPS. He's uh, chairman of our commission um, on environment. And um, he has a degree in geography from the University of Munster, where he min minored in biology and geology. He specialized in landscape ecology. He is managing director of the ecological consultancy Hofer and Pouts in Germany that he established in 1988 to offer a range of services relating to the ecology, assessment, EIA, planning, inventory and surveying of wetlands, including peatlands. And uh, he is going to talk to us about the new recently published German peatland protection strategy. He is going to give, him, give us his assessment. Over to Bernd. Thank you very much, Jack, and hello from Münster in Germany to Glasgow. I would like to look at the main points of the German peatland protection strategy and their importance for the peatlands in Germany. In Germany, of the 1.8 million hectare of organic soils, more than 90% are drained and are responsible for about 53 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year, 6.7% of national emissions. A reduction of 5 million ton CO2 equivalents is postulated as the target by 2030. First, I would like to take a look at the data basis of this strategy. As in most European countries, the aerial survey of peatlands took place in the second half of the last century. Since then, only partial revision mapping has been done. And most maps today are created by merging GIS data sets. In a current study in the district of Emsland, the actual stock of organic soils is verified on the basis of 10,000 drillings. It is becoming apparent that the losses due to agricultural use are enormous. An outdated database brings the strategy and its planning approaches into question. But now to the question, of what contribution the different sectors of use can make to the 5 million ton reduction goal. Peat extraction and horticultural peat use contribute by 7% of greenhouse gases from peatlands, according to data from the Geological Survey of Lower Saxony. Under the conditions listed here, which are formulated in the strategy, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of around 1 million tons can be assumed. This includes the termination of peat extraction in Germany, but also the use of peat in substrate production and thus 
also the import of peat from other countries. Near natural and or protected peatlands account for 9% of emissions from German peatlands. But in most of these areas, conservation has been taking steps to address revetting for decades. Where these measures have not been successful so far, no major contribution to the reduction can be expected in the future. A major reason in this emerging is the emerging dry and hot summers caused by climate change itself. The forested organic soils in Germany are mostly located in the fence. Proportionate to their area share, about 33,000 hectares would need to be revetted by 2030. Paludi culture can make a valuable contribution here. But by far the largest contribution must be made by agriculturally used peatlands, which also generate the largest share of emissions at around 80%. To achieve a reduction of 3.3 million tons of annual greenhouse gas emissions, about 120,000 hectares must be revetted and restored to Myers by 2030. My conclusions. A good policy needs a good database. A poor databases can only lead to poor results. Even the goal of reducing emissions from peatlands by 5 million or 10% by 2030 will require enormous efforts. These projects will take years to develop plan and implement. Therefore, the process of converting around 150,000 hectares would have to start today to reach the target in 2030. But unlike the contribution from horticultural peat use, the contributions from forestry and agriculture are voluntary. After the recent experience with agriculture in the publication of a national peatland conservation strategy, it is not clear to me personally where the willingness to do so, so will occur. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Bernd. Bernd is a very excellent person at uh, looking and calculating numbers. And uh, he and I worked together on these uh, numbers, especially from drained uh, peatlands. And as he stated at the end, in Germany, 80% of the emissions are coming from agriculture. The, that coming from uh, peat extraction is uh, minuscule in comparison. And uh, that's not to say that uh, that should not be addressed. Move to the next speaker that is uh, moving um, around the world again, another very long time and good friend of mine, Professor Mitsuru Osaki, Emeritus Professor at the Hokkaido University in, in Japan. Uh, he has, uh, he's a person who has uh, much traveled, has done very much uh, research. He was trained as a plant physiologist. That's uh, close to my heart because I also was trained as a plant physiologist and a soil scientist and his doctorate is from Hokkaido University in Japan. He's carried out many collaborative partnership uh, projects and uh, a leader of, uh, of, of JST JICA project on, on wildfire fire and carbon management. He's published um, several hundred papers written, 72 books. There's no end to the, um, the status of, uh, of, of this guy. He and his colleagues joined me in, uh, in central Kalimantan in the peatlands when I invited his colleague, uh, Dr. Hidenori Takahashi, um, in 1993 to come and, and, and use his microclimatological expertise. And since then, Japanese uh, teams built up and built up and uh, and more than dwarfed even what I was doing but together 
I think we've done some good work. Over to you, Mitsuru. That's there for you. Thank you, Jack. So today I want to talk about uh, natural, natural capitals. So this is a. Uh, oh. So natural capital is not a common the concept uh, in this peatland, but uh, you know the. Peatland has very high the capacity of the natural capitals because of the lot of the water, water storage, carbon storage, and the high biomass and the high bio biodiversity. So this is a, I, I believe one of the, the best or highest natural capital in world ecosystems. So if mismanagement of this high natural capital ecosystems so the value is decreasing quickly. So the PV is uh, planetary boundaries. I forgot uh, the information one and two, the climate something. And so the, if the develop, so now, so almost come to the red, this is uh, over the boundaries. And so now I say that PV is uh, P to boundaries. So almost come to the red and some of still yellow, and so what is the pit, the water, high water level, and the stock is a pit. And so the, this the, the decrease by the climate change impact and the human impact. Then so the carbon emission is increasing. This is uh, something related to natural the capitals in the pit run. So in this condition, if developed, the, the peat runs, so decreasing quickly. And so, but uh, we developed a new technology, uh, increasing water tables. Then so the peat decomposition is reduced and the fire also reduced. And in this condition, high water tables, the normally the oil pump difficult to grow. But uh, you know, you go to in, inside of the natural forestry, the, that grows very well because of the have uh, something the aerial root and this root absorb oxygen and also we found the nitrogen fixation. Then so the artificial this kind of the uh, uh, aerial root induced by using something the this is uh, something the the plastic bag and into the compost the microorganisms and the charcoals and the vermiculite and so on. Then so the only put near the, the, the oil palms, the root come into and absorb the nutrients and also oxygen and nitrogen. So this is an excellent system, even in the, the high water tables. Then so we're developing the new concept. So now, now we are suffering about uh, developing. So this is uh, consume the natural the resources. This is uh, developing mechanisms. And so next papillon, the sustainable development goals, also still the developing. But we propose opposite the concept. So we call develop, uh, envelopment mechanism. That is not developed. And so what is a uh, development mechanisms? So at first, they try to use the fossil fuels. Then so the resource the management. So this is a uh, invest to material asset, for example, the building or, or road or so on. And so these societies that I call the harvested sand societies. Harvested sand means oil, the fossil fuels. Then so a lot of the CO2 emission, and so, but maybe we get something as political capitals. But just this system now, so we are discussing about so many problems, must change. And so we de de develop a new concept. So this is a, we use the solar energy. This is a basic. And so in, in tropicals, 
the tree is a good the materials to absorb energy or produce energy. And so this the asset is uh, in materials. And so we invested the uh, asset into the, the natural capital. So why the, this is an immaterial asset? Then so this society we call the harvesting sun, only using the sun energies. And so we, we get the natural capital into the, the natures. And so carbon, carbon is a negative, not the neutrals and not positives. So in this system, carbon is uh, negative. And so this is some, something summary. So I explained already the development mechanisms and envelopment mechanisms. And the midway to envelopment mechanisms, for example, the sustainable development. development. This is uh, still discussing in all of the indices. Uh, and so what is uh, the sustainable development? And so this is uh, from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And so maybe the techno garden and the order from the strengths adapting the mosaic and so uh, <laughs> something. <laughs> anyway, so this basically I agree with this concept, except energy sectors. So in, in this sectors, they are recommended to use the what they say artificial energy, for example, the, the solar panels and the windows. So but this technology introduced to the tropical peatland or tropics. This make a destroy the land, and so come to a, another serious the, the problem. So why the we now so summarize this society the carbon positive society you, using the chemical uh, fossil fuels, and this is a carbon neutral. So now we are discussing so many the carbon neutral, but the, we more the high target. This is a carbon negatives. Carbon, if without carbon negatives, so difficult to conserve the tropical, the tropics areas, the peatland also another. And so this is a harvesting sun societies and this is a harvested sun societies. We use the fossil fuel and the harvesting sun societies is very important. And so this is, a, I, I call the techno sun societies. So what mean techno? This is a, the uh, wind powers and the solar powers. So intermediate, but this technology into here make a destroy of the ecosystem. And so for future target, we must to, to establish this kind of the new the system which is a uh, environment mechanisms to detect or evaluation all of them. So we propose the new informatics based on equator observation system, IEOS. That, that is a, you can see the inflow of this, the papillons. And also this, the, what they say, environment mechanism is a quite a new concept. I, explain the details in this new book of the Petra. Thank you. Any of you want to ask more, you can, you can speak to Professor Osaki. Unfortunately, we are against the clock and uh, we have one more active speaker to go and we must give him the, the right to, to present. Um, his name is uh, his Dr. Florian uh, Seeger, who is somewhere. And Florian is uh, founder and CEO of a, of a company called Remote Sensing Solutions. And uh, he's the founder of an, another company of 3D reality uh, maps. He is also a professor for environmental monitoring in the Faculty of Biology 
at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany, and uh, a member of the Biocenter. He's going to tell us something about monitoring peatlands and restoration by remote sensing. Over to Florian. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Um, I'm pleased to be here and to have the opportunity to give you a short overview of current state of the art earth observation technologies to monitor peatlands. Peatlands are found on only 3% of the Earth's land surface, but they store nearly 30% of the terrestrial carbon. Peatlands formed uh, mainly in the boreal region and in the tropics, and I will focus in my presentation on tropical peatlands. The expansion of agriculture and logging on peatlands leads to huge uh, greenhouse gas emissions. As a result, peat fires and peat drainage cause almost 10% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. To be able to take uh, action and to reduce these emissions, we need detailed knowledge on what is uh, going on. Uh, however, till now, most peatlands on a global scale are poorly mapped, many still unknown, and especially in the tropics, peatlands are very inaccessible on ground because they are basically swamps located in remote uninhabited areas like the Amazon Basin or the Congo Basin, which are covered by dense forests. It's not a surprise that the current area estimates show a wide range and more importantly, peat depths is largely unknown and therefore also the amount of carbon stored. Earth observation offers now completely new possibilities to map and monitor peatlands on a larger, on an even global scale. The number of satellites has grown exponentially in the past decade. Mapping and monitoring peatlands requires a whole range of different satellite sensors with different properties. In our analysis, we use 10 different satellite instruments to cover all aspects of the peatland ecosystem. Um, to map and monitor land cover and land use, for example, we use the Sentinel-2 satellites. Sentinel-2 is operated by the European Space Agency, ESA, and the data uh, with 10 meter spatial resolution is available for free. In this false color image, you see pristine peat swamp forest in the middle, in the center, oil palm plantation in the upper part and smallholder agriculture in the upper left. Another ESA satellite is Sentinel-1. Uh, this satellite allows to monitor several parameters uh, like deforestation, burned area, soil moisture or water bodies. In this satellite with image, which is an optical image, uh, clouds and haze obscure the land surface. And if you look at the radar image of the same area, same day and same area, we have a clear view on what happens on the land surface. So this is exactly the same day. Uh, orange red colors indicate the deforestation and forest degradation by actively burning fires. So radar satellites are the only ones which able, are able to penetrate clouds and haze. These radar satellites like Sentinel-1 allow also to monitor soil moisture. It can be used to assess peat drainage and to monitor the success of peat rewetting. This slide shows a multi-temporal Sentinel-1 composite uh, from, from the years 2016 to 2020. And red indica indicates a trend for soils getting drier and blue indicates a trend for soils getting wetter. The peat surface topography is another very important piece of information we need. Tandem X and JDA are two satellites which deliver three-dimensional digital elevation data, and the surface topography is required to assess water flows, slope, and dam construction sites when, uh, re for restoration. Using these technologies, RSS has conducted a large peatland mapping survey in Indonesia in the past two years. 15 million hectares have been mapped in great detail. 
This work was done on behalf of the Indonesian Peatland Restoration Agency, BRG, and financed by UNOPS. Main major findings were that the peat area was 10% uh, larger than previously known, but more importantly, peat carbon store was two times, 2.6 times larger than previously estimated. So this is very important information for improving peatland management uh, technologies. We also investigated the current land cover on peat deeper than three meters, so which uh, shouldn't be used for agricultural use or other purposes. Um, and these peatlands are especially important in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And we found that 29% uh, of the peat area was plantation, 60% was drained, and 73% was degraded to some extent, for example, by recurrent fires. So with this observation, uh, we can identify yet unknown peatlands in very remote areas like Papua New Guinea, Central Africa, or in the Amazon Basin, map its current status, and we can estimate above and below ground carbon stores using satellites. We can identify major sources of greenhouse gas emissions. We can plan ecological restoration, and we can monitor the success of rewetting. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I do apologize, you're the last uh, speaker in a long line of uh, excellent presentations. And uh, I say we've uh, overrun completely and eaten into Q&A time. Uh, I'm not going to show the video on the Mer Merlin project. I mentioned it uh, verbally and it's on the website. So um, I'm, I'm going to jump that, and uh, we've been allowed uh, time for one question, or maybe we'll squeeze it to two. And the guys in control said that uh, that's a special favour to me because I'm a Glaswegian, so <laughs> certainly indebted. So do we have any uh, questions or comment from, from this floor? No great rush, but I have uh, some uh, um, some here in front of me, and I'm just thinking. Uh, well, let's ask one of uh, um, Gus van Berkel, since, since he presented on a, a topic that uh, many people here don't know m much about the the much criticised uh, peat um, extraction and growing media industry. Here's a question for you, Gus. How quickly can the growing media industry transition to sustainable peat alternatives? Now, I must admit, I do not like the word sustainable because it uh, means many different things to many different people. So I never know which version they're talking about. But I'll ask you, can you give a quick uh, response to that? And does, does he need a mic? Or, no, you, you, you are. A quick, quick response, I would say, is it, can you hear me? Yeah. A quick response, I think for the hobby market, home gardening, there is a possibility in, in five to 10 years, it, it's already a, a big challenge for the commercial, for the growing media, for the professional horticulture. You have seen the prognosis of, uh, of uh, scientists of uh, Chris Block in 2025, um, we will reach uh, a 30% uh, peat still remaining in the, in the mixtures. And uh, if we go to zero, I cannot answer this question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to sneak in one uh, last one, and uh, because I it's completely um, different. And uh, this question for the panel, are you optimistic for the future of peatlands in Southeast Asia, given the pristine, the loss of pristine forests to development? Would any of the, my panel colleagues like to comment? Or would anyone who is out there um, or virtually like to comment about the future of uh, Southeast Asia peatlands. Uh, 
Ah, well, <laughs> is that up to me then? <laughs> the problem with Southeast Asia peatlands is the peat is not formed from sphagnum moss and low growing shrubs. It's formed from peat swamp forest trees that grow to a height of 30 to 40 meters. The peat is formed largely from, from the roots. If you don't get the forest trees back, you don't get the peat. It take at least 200 years to get that back. It is, it is the biggest challenge on this planet. And with people and climate change, my prognosis would be bad. Well, I think we have to wind it up. The guys here have, have another uh, session uh, very quickly. I must thank my presenters who have done so virtually. Apologize, we haven't got time for many more questions um, and discussion. But your presentations have been incredible. They've been really first class, fantastic, and very informative to a wide audience that I'm sure didn't realize um, this uh, was behind the scenes. And it showcases how important partnerships really are. I mentioned partnerships can be two to infinity. And the, and the science community, they're absolutely essential. So I also thank my colleagues who are here who have fought their way through the Glasgow protests. I thank the technical team and the organizers of this fantastic pavilion. I wish you good success and enjoy the rest of the program on this pavilion for the rest of this COP. Thank you very much.